physician computer company. JCC empowers independent pediatricians, streamlining daily operations and improving financial stability. A trusted pediatric partner for 40 years, we offer award-winning support, personalized training, seamless data transitions, and practice analytics. With inclusive pricing, a lively peer community, and a free annual users conference, you can focus on what matters the most, your patients. Explore more at pcc.com. That is pcc.com. George, how um, are you? Thursday afternoon for a change. Yeah. Today we have a great physician, Dr. John Farrell. And he's going to talk to us on a topic that's interesting for a lot of people in pediatrics, moving an anti-bullying bill into law. How do we do this? I think most people don't know how this happens. So you'll enlighten us, Dr. Farrell. Yeah. Happy Dr. Terry. John is a dear friend of mine. He was very kind to trust me and allow me to care for his kids at Pediatrics at Night for many years. He also was able to calm me down when my teen son would ask me the most embarrassing questions. We've been friends for a very long time, and I really appreciate him being on the podcast, but most of all, his enduring friendship and trust in my care of his kids. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. I'm um, humbled to be here looking at your list of guests and um, I'm your primary care pediatrician, but really happy. And I love the format. So thanks. Uh, you are a physician leader. I do think this is an example of how I, I wouldn't have expected myself to have achieved this. And it comes with a lot of help and we can talk about that. John, we always start the podcast by asking people, why did you become a pediatrician? I grew up in Reston, Virginia, not too far from where Dr. Bravo is sitting now. And my dad and my grandfather were both pediatricians. And uh, I think my dad used reverse psychology on me, telling me not to get married, not to have children, and not to go into medicine. And if I did, don't become a pediatrician. So being a young and rebellious man, I decided to basically go against all of his piece of advice. But honestly, in medical school, I just bonded, as I think most of us did, to the pediatricians. I found them to be the happiest people and the people that I was most comfortable talking to. So uh -huh. I never asked you this question. Do you have brothers or sisters and did any of them follow in the, into the medical career? Yeah, no, I was the only one to go into medicine. I have one brother and two sisters. Uh, one's an attorney, but no, nobody else went. And, and I have three of my own boys and none of them went into healthcare. So the line ends here. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, grandchild, maybe a grandchild. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so when you came back from medical school or residency in Pittsburgh, you joined your dad's practice in Reston and Reston back then was the boonies. There was still a lot of farmland in between DC and Dallas airport. Today is a mega city, right? There's no, not a space left on that highway. What was your dad's practice like when you came back? It's a good question. He was a solo pediatrician. I think he'd had one partner once, but uh, he was a fiercely independent and very structured man. When I joined him, he was, I think we're talking about burnout in times currently, but I do feel like my dad was a little bit burnt out. He had let the practice not necessarily die, but decrease in size naturally because he was starting to limit his hours, those types of things. Now he had a very loyal set of, of families that followed him, which I think set me up for some success, but, but he was working, I think four days a week, had the office closed, a lot of half days. But like I said, had a loyal following and had a great reputation in the community. So it was certainly wonderful to walk into that and to, and then to get to work with him, to work side by side with your father and have him teach me all that you didn't know from residency, all the stuff about, I, I must've consulted with him a hundred times about rashes and still use the lessons he taught me today. So that was So your, your, your dad was obviously not on EHR. 
he, <laughs> so he was the opposite. When I joined my father, I had to convince him to get a third telephone line and a fax machine at the time. This is 1996. And he had the two nurses that he employed also were your front desk and they did the billing. But yeah, we had absolutely no technology in the office. I even had to get a nebulizer. He didn't even have one of those. So what about a pulse ox? Not yet. No, no. Those were very no. expensive in 96. No. Yeah. Yeah. He, and he was pretty old fashioned. It felt like yeah, who needed a pulse ox? You just needed a physical exam. So yeah. and, and obviously he didn't have a cell phone. He didn't have a pager through a, a big part of his career. So what was that like when you were a child? Like just on a Sunday, how would that work? So a good portion of my childhood was spent in the back of the car waiting for him to finish his calls at pay phones. So anytime when we went out and he was solo and shared call with another famous Northern Virginia pediatrician, Dr. Albert Monez. And so he was on every other weekend. So when we were out, we would have to stop. He would put feed quarters. We always has a thing of quarters. He would feed them into the telephone, call the answering service, get a list of parents to call back. And we would just have to sit there, the four children, while he made phone calls from a payphone. <laughs> and did people visit your house if he wanted to see a kid? He would be having supper and they come on the porch and he'd take a look and decide whether he needed to do something. That, that's how m m myself and my siblings got chicken pox, actually. We had a visit from a neighbor wanting to know if this was chicken pox, right? Walked right into our foyer and my dad ushered them right out onto the porch, but it was too late. To my chagrin, it was over Christmas break, so we weren't able to miss any schools. He, yeah, he, he was uh, an a, ultimate community physician, so. It was a different house world. calls too? I'm sorry? Did he make house calls also? Yeah, at the beginning he did, I think those kind of went away with time. And I have the ledger from my grandfather's practice where he charged $2 for an office visit and three for a house call. He was in Clarksburg, West Virginia. Oh, yeah. It's really fascinating to look at the, the finances back then. Yeah. But they didn't have to, they didn't have to pay for their dinners. When you did house calls, but you got some sort of alcoholic drink and some sort of meal at the house and you couldn't say no because it was offensive to the mother who was hosting. Yeah. She would make you a meal and she'd give you a drink and then you go on to the next house. Exactly. It was a very different world. So what advice, you, you basically went from a solo pediatrician mm -hmm. to multiple offices and a large group. What advice would you give these young pediatricians today that are leaving the big health system and are venturing on their own? Wow, that's a pretty broad question. But I mean, I think obviously you have to look at, at the size of the practice. I guess I can only speak from my experience. When I joined my dad, I knew that I didn't necessarily want the lifestyle that I had grown up with. I wanted to make sure that I had some weekends to be with family and also to have a practice where I felt like the patients knew me and I knew them. So striking that balance is, as you guys know, it's always difficult. So I went ahead and just slowly started to try to build up the practice in terms of volume and bring on new doctors. I didn't have a formula except for, okay, now we're scheduling visits more than two, two months out and we're full. Let's hire a new doctor. And it worked out really well that I'm now on every fourth or fifth weekend. And I get to spend time with my boys when they were little. And now as they're older, travel with them if I need to. A lot of it is size of practice. And then almost also, how much are you willing to trust your partners? Because very particular about the way I practice medicine, and I think you get trained a certain way and you want to find a group that works in that same fashion. And that is not easy to do. And it's certainly worth exploring that detail as much as you can before you join. And what kind of practice are you in now or what kind of practices you develop? So we have two offices now. We have 14 physicians, a mixture of part-time and full-time physicians. I have now five partners, five total partners, and the rest are employed physicians. And we have one office in, in Reston. My, origin, my dad's original office has been ripped down for the metro coming through, but we moved over near the hospital. And the other office is in the, the, the town that I ended up living in. I tried to move back to Reston, but it was too expensive. So I moved out to Loudoun County, and I'm out here in Loudoun now. So basically, your father planted the seed, and yep. it grew, and you cultivated that seed and made a field. 
Yeah. And, and, and I'm in an area with, I think at some point, the area that I live in had the highest birth rate of the entire United States. So uh, a lot of young couples moving out here, again, similar to me, they couldn't afford being close to the city, the typical suburban spread. So yeah. what makes you think, what made your practice succeed as a starter off as a solo practice practitioner, and now you're a bigger group? What was the secret sauce? I think I have the answer to that. What's that? I think one of the genius things he did is, I don't know if this was intentional, but so Rustin, when his dad started Rustin, really was the poor dogs. It was very far from the city. Now it's a mega metropolis and extremely expensive. Huh? When he came back, he moved out to South Riding, which is an outer suburb, like even more outer than Long Island is. Mm -hmm. And that's where all the young families were. And he really was involved in the community. John was really part of the community with his boys and he lived there. He was, he was involved in the schools and that gave him a, a huge advantage. And no one else was out there when he went out first. He right. was first practice in that outer suburb. I think you were the first one out there. Yeah, that's uh, true. I replicated what my dad had done in Reston, but I will say that commitment to community is something that's near and dear to my heart. And I, I can't say that I did that solely because to grow the practice, but it certainly was a, a secondary goal of mine. Growing up in Reston, as Dr. Bravo was talking about, it was its own community and it supported me through some tough times. And my high school, I still remember my high school athletic trainer being such a caring person and helping me through sports injuries. And I had a high school football coach. I know this sounds like Hollywood, but I wouldn't be sitting here today without him inspiring me to set goals and move forward. So when I moved back to the area, that same athletic trainer asked me to do sports physicals for the local high school. And of course, I couldn't turn her down. And, and that's when I started to get involved with community work. And it really is enriching. I think a lot of us are struggling, or I hear a lot of my younger colleagues talking about burnout and feeling burnt out. And of course, there are days and times when I'm exhausted, but I do think this kind of finding out what your community is, finding out what it needs. And, and we are uniquely situated to know what our communities need. The, the old overused statement of finger on the pulse is definitely where we are as pediatricians. And then trying to meld that with what your interests are and where you may have some expertise is how this worked out. So it seems random now when I look back, but starting there, I started to work with my local high school. So if we talk about community the athletic trainer for the new high school that had been built out here, there weren't any physicians, so they needed somebody to be on the sidelines. Did I know anything about sports medicine? I mean, wasn't particularly trained in it, but I had three sons and people kept asking me about injuries when I was on the sidelines. So I had done some self-education and then I started to spend time there. And I will tell you guys, I learned more from that athletic trainer than I learned in any orthopedic rotation being there. And the examination of an athlete recently injured right off the field is so different than the way they appear in your office the next day after all those muscles and tendons have stiffened. So it really helped me in my practice to build up that knowledge base and then serve that population. That was my first commitment. And it does get you seen because high school football is high school football. Get a lot of folks from the community going. And so yeah, it worked out well. Now, I'd be curious to ask you the following question, and I'm sure you've dealt with this. How did you deal with, when you came up with a good idea to expand, to develop, to pivot, as they say today, when your senior physician, which was your father, said to you, why do we have to change? We've always done it like this. How did you deal with that? Because I dealt with this my entire career. I think that father-son relationship allowed me to maybe say things to him that I might not have said to a, a different senior partner. But going back to the original, I think, I think my dad was burnt out. He had really done this solo his whole life. He'd been 30 years in Reston and I think he was ready to step back. And so I got to work with him for three years, but he retired at that point. And that's honestly when I look back and I was woefully unprepared to take over practice at that point. No business training at all, no knowledge of billing, but I was young and enthusiastic and, and naive. So well, I took over the practice takes. for it. That's all it takes, right? It takes that drive and sometimes that almost lack of knowledge. If I look back on it now, I'd say, what are you doing, young man? But, but I think hiring the right people. So I, I got some business consultants and, and realizing what you don't know and asking for help. So that's pretty simple, but that's what I did. 
So part of that journey included Mani Olgar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with him, you created a billing service, Capture. Yeah. Billing. Yeah. So finding somebody who's trained in the medical side of billing, it was not my passion and I didn't have, I had no education on it. So bringing in an office manager to help me with that, Manny Oliveras helped me to grow to build properly and to, and to make it financially viable to then bring on a new physician. Um, so I talked to Manny because I wanted to be on the podcast to talk about everything building. He said, absolutely not. I am a grandpa now and I am doing Disney yeah. grandpa and I don't want anything to do with billing anymore. Yeah. There, there's a burnout in that profession as well. And I think Manny did burn out, but and then we've now uh, parted ways, but he was essential to growing. So again, it's it's hiring the right people and realizing what you don't know and where your strengths are. Are you still a partner or owner of Capture Billing or is that? No, that, that venture is over. And uh, you, you guys, I don't want to bore our audience, but we're now part of Trusted Doctors. Dr. Sandy Chung, who's our current AAP president, has headed a group that does does the billing for us. And I will say she has many talents and one of those is negotiations with insurance companies. So she's quite talented. And so when you were involved in the billing, what was the key lessons you learned about an effective billing team other than hiring the right people? I don't know how exciting that is for the audience, but consistency and hiring again, I know, I know you said not hiring by the right people. I'm more of an ideas person and knowing that you're an ideas person, knowing that you need type A people who are going to check every box and make sure every letter is in the right position. And that's not me. And so I will say both myself and Manny would interview people and make sure that they were incredibly detail oriented. You guys know the games that insurance companies play if you don't put it in the right box or you don't click it properly. And this is again, all before EMRs did that for us. That's where we came up with the title capture because you really felt like you weren't capturing en- enough. And at some point I was looking and we were getting paid, I don't know, for six out of every 10 visits, we were losing 40% of our income because of billing mistakes. And so really just drilling that down, looking very carefully at the percentages of what you're seeing and what's coming in and what your losses are. And we reduced that number to 8% and that made a huge difference. So, yeah. It's a difficult game. Still, it's a very difficult game. Despite of all the computers and all the automation, it is still where practices fail the most. But you guys know as pediatricians, you get a lot of complaints coming at you from parents. And I think the analogy I always use is when you were in kindergarten, there was that one little boy who made up a game. He made up some rules. You would play it. And then as soon as you started to win, he would change the rules to favor himself. He grew up to be an insurance company executive. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the Pediatric Lounge. Please note that this episode contains a discussion of suicide, bullying, self-injurious behavior, depression, and other references to other mental health disorders that may act as triggers. Dr. Leah Cagino has over 15 episodes on our podcast that deal with death by suicide in teens and teenagers, everything from prevention to treatment. If you feel that you need more information, that's a wonderful resource. Again, pediatricmeltdown.com, or you can listen to it wherever you download your podcast. Pay particular attention to episode number 106 on how to build community around children to prevent death by suicide. So who was Brody? Yeah. So to jump into the advocacy bar in March of February of 2022, I got that phone call that all pediatricians just hate to hear from the family, a family friend of the Watsons. They're a family in my practice that one of our 12 year old patients had committed suicide, that he had died by a gunshot wound. And it just, you go, I still get chills saying this out loud. And you think about the emotions you have and the, the thought process. And it was shocking, just not him. There's no way it was him. It couldn't be this young man, but it was. And I think, so of course, reaching out to the family in a period of crisis and help him, helping them go through it. So I think one of our, one of our also tough parts is when an autopsy comes in is to sit down with the family and go through it. About three weeks later, I sat down with the family in their house and just talked them through this. And, and I think with, how do I say this right? With our current political climate, our children, I feel, are just a mirror of what they see. So much they absorb and reflect. And 
I have seen in the last three years a lot more bullying complaints, a lot more almost harshness. Obviously, social media contributes and the way that a bully can stay anonymous is now accentuated and enhanced. But I just know those complaints come through my office every day. I'm dealing with them all the time. And the severity and the frequency of this comes in. So Brody had been bullied. He was the, I would state, he's the alpha male of a seventh grade class. He was very smart, good looking kid, very athletic. And I think a group of eighth graders had just decided to pick on him. And I don't think he'd really been in that situation before. He didn't have that experience and certainly had the pride of, and the, he was the kid that looked out for the other kids. So he had come off the bus one Monday and went to a school administrator and was in tears and, and that school administrator talked to him, sat him down, found out that this had been happening recurrently. And in the current school system we have in Virginia, you have five days if you're a school administrator to report an episode of bullying. And so that administrator was, had known that, didn't make a phone call to the parents. And unfortunately, the night after that, that Tuesday night, Brody took his own life. His, he obviously had access to firearms. His parents were hunters. They had come from North Carolina. There's that aspect of it. But I think when I sit down with the parents, of course, the question is, this could have been prevented. And as pediatricians, it just rips you to the core to know that there's a tragedy that could be prevented. Mr. Watson was like, we get emails every day about lunch. We get emails about so many different things, so many communications from the school, but they couldn't communicate this to us in a timely fashion where what could I do to make my home safe? Are there things we would have done differently? I don't know but I would have liked to have had the chance. At that time, I was serving on the American Academy of Pediatric School Health Task Force. Uh, it had been formed during COVID with an attempt to try and help Virginia schools with how to navigate the pandemic and everything there. So it was a pretty big group. I had Dr. Leah Rowland from, from Virginia Beach as the chair, Chris Powell, who's our current president, part of that group. And I, I went and looked at all the different counties of Virginia, and there was quite a disparate number of days. So in Loudoun and Fairfax, it was five days. There was a county down in Southwest Virginia that had 12 days before notification. And I think these policies may have been in place for quite some time before there was the communication ability we have now. And as you guys know, as pediatricians, 24 hours in the mind of a 12-year-old can seem like forever. So I forwarded this to the committee. I was like, are you guys aware of this? Does anybody feel like me that this is just inherently wrong? I know that if my boys were being bullied, I would want to know right away. I think as part of the team, we need the pediatricians, the counselors, and of course, the parents to be involved. So I got a lot of support from them. They helped to navigate. I think because of my position there, I wouldn't have known what to do if I hadn't been you know, active in the community that got me to that role, but they got me in touch with Virginia's American Academy of Pediatrics lobbyist. So we actually have a lobbyist and she understands the nature of political action. Um, her name's Lauren Schmidt. She is incredibly impressive. She knows um, how to get this started. She helped me draft a bill. In the KISS principle, it's keep it simple. So we basically tried to, we, we, she got me in touch with Delegate Glenn Davis down in Virginia Beach and Senator John Bell from up here because he's in the same district that the Watson family lives in. And Senator Bell met with the family, myself and Lauren, after Lauren coordinated it, he heard their story. Um, he's unfortunately also had lost a son. So it was something that, that he embraced completely. And he agreed to sponsor the bill. Delegate Davis from the, from the Senate side or from the uh, House side sponsored it. So we had the bill going through both sides of the House and the Senate with the majority party supporting it on both sides. So after Lawrence submitted that and we had the support, the bill gets put in committee. That bill went to the House subcommittee and the Senate subcommittee for education. And so in one day in January, there is a, a testimony that can be given by people who want to speak about the bill with a lot of bravery, Mr. Watson and Mrs. Watson and myself, uh, the bravery is coming from their side, went down and testified in front of the nine senators and then five or nine delegates and five senators. We did it twice in January. And you can imagine the testimony from Mr. Watson up there. He, he turned to me and said, I don't think I could do this. And I said, just read it. Just go up there and read it. And he went up and read it. And there wasn't a dry eye in that room after he finished. And we got a little pushback from school administrators, but they actually, after hearing his testimony, pulled back a little bit. 
Lauren had talked to them before. A lot of stuff goes behind the scenes, as you guys know, and she understood what their issues were, but with this on the floor. And interestingly, when we were there, two other families who were there for other reasons got up and spoke about zero tolerance for bullying and what it means and, and really helped support the bill. And it was unanimous. It went out of committee. So if you guys remember the schoolhouse rock on, I'm just a bill on Capitol Hill, right. we did get out of committee. And uh, then it goes to the full house and the full Senate where it gets voted on. Um, and I'm really proud to say it was unanimous. It passed a hundred to nothing in the, in the house and really passed the Senate unanimously. So it was signed into law in, uh, on July 1st. And there was a ceremony, uh, governor Youngkin was there and they presented the bill. The Watson family went up and the hope is that, uh, this will change some things. I do feel, and I, I wanted to talk to school administrators before doing this. And I feel like, you know, I, I certainly wanted to hear their side of it. And it's a little bit like a law that one of my friends pointed out. It's a little bit like a law that pediatricians have to wash their hands between each patient. Most people are already doing 24 hour notification and most pediatricians are washing their hands, but for the one time it slips through, we just don't want that to end up in a tragedy. So um, pretty, pretty proud of it. We hope that saves some lives going forward. And again, the whole thing was supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics, Chris Powell, Dr. Roland. Barbara Boardman is a pediatrician from up here, worked for Kaiser. She is now working with legislature stuff. A lot of this stuff was going on for the 25 years I've been in practice without being involved with the AP. I had no idea how much work goes on and how much they do. But if anybody who's listening to this is interested, that is really your avenue to get change done. I feel like I just stumbled into this and blindly went through it, but the support that they gave me helped me get it through and, and it's passed. So. And so when it went to the floor, did you have to do some of the calling to the other legislators and senators or visit them or get them aware of how important this was? We, we did. And actually that was where we got incredible support. I'm looking to my other screen because there was a, in January, there is a legislative day where the entire AAP, we had, I would say probably 50 pediatricians on a white coat day went down and we visited offices um, for every single delegate and senator. And we went in groups of four or five of us, walked in and talked to them about why we supported this bill, what it was meant to be, to give them the human side of it. And we also talked to them about BMAP. We also talked to them about budgeting. We also talked to them about reach out and read, about transgender care. It was really fascinating. Again, this was my first foray into this, but it was enlightening to see and, and a pretty powerful experience. So even if I don't have a bill next January, I'm going to try and take that Thursday off and go down because you, you can get things done. I think you do feel that burnout sometimes at that hopelessness that things aren't going to change, but they, this is one of the most effective ways to do it is through politics and it's not easy. And that's where you need someone like Lauren. She understands the ins and outs of this to, to the depths that it's confusing. And I think one of her points is that there aren't many physicians in the Virginia Senate, or I think there's only one currently, and she's up for reelection. And she says, because you guys are too smart and too logical. <laughs> and BMAP, is that Virginia Medicaid? Is that the mental access program? I have a uh, patient who's having a mental health care crisis. The BMAP both does the REACH program to train pediatricians in how to manage mental health care and also has resources for you with a phone number that you can call to talk to a mental health care professional if you've got a child in crisis and you're not sure which direction to go. And again, I'll drop her name again. That was started by Dr. Chung, and it's really been quite successful. And currently, for example, again, advocacy, there is a push to actually pay us to do the jobs we're already doing, and that is coming from the Virginia AAP. They are pushing our current governor to put into the new budget payment for mental health care services. Right. Um, immensurate with what we are already doing. Cause you guys know if you're in the trenches like myself, that is a daily occurrence and it's taking inordinate amounts of time and, and we're not going to stop doing it, but we should be compensated for it. So That's right. definitely. Yes. There, there, there is a big problem across the, the country with lack of payment for the services we're providing. Some states are worse than others, but it's unsustainable. Every, I hate to say this, but almost every week we talk to someone who says they have a friend whose practice went out of business or 
the, they have a friend who, one, one of the ones that really gets to me is a, a story out of Chicago where the pediatrician's parents were immigrants and they started a pediatric practice in a low income neighborhood. And she inherited the practice and she had to close it because she couldn't make ends meet. Oh, well, $44 uh, but, is visit. You can't. No. And, and that's the kind of story that just breaks your heart because it's like you, she had the connection with that community. She grew up in that neighborhood. She cared enough to come back. She's a smart person. She could have gone to one of the nicer suburbs in Chicago where everybody's got insurance, but she stayed there and she's close to it. And one of our members in our mastermind group, a practice a mile from her, a solo owner, just had enough. And she's closing the practice in a month, moving to the FQH, leaving 3,000 patients without care. And we hear that story over and over again. And it's very sad. The kids can't be taken care of by patient first or an internal medicine doctor. They need pediatricians. And no matter how, what a great job we've done. Liver cancer has gone. Cervical cancer should be gone. These deadly viruses and bacteria are gone. Rheumatic heart disease is gone, but there's still going to be accidents and sprains and colds and COVID and other H1N1 pandemics. These things will happen. Yeah. And the children will need, the, will need the care. Happen with all those people? They're just going to go to the emergency room for a sprain and the hospital will bill the insurance company 5000 They'll get paid three and uh, they'll move on. That's what will happen. It will save a dollar. Yeah, I know it's a broken system and it's hard to work in it. It can be so disheartening to hear those stories. All I can say is if you're listening to this podcast and you want to get involved, I have gone from 25 years not really being as involved with the AAP as I think I should have. And now that I see what they do, I feel reinvigorated. Again, I know everyone's busy. I know everyone has only so much time, but the, the AAP has a legislative committee, a school health committee, a mental health committee, a wellness committee. If you just want to help other pediatricians, if you feel like you could help out there, they have a wellness committee. And this is all in Virginia. And I suspect these committees exist in other states as well. I just I don't know. You'd be shocked. The AAP in Virginia is very well run. Mm -hmm. So it's very well run in Rhode Island. You get to New York, not so much so. The, the other thing that I'll point out that I wasn't aware of is I, I would pay into the AAP every year, go to the conferences probably every two to three years to get my CME. None of that money goes for political action. And I, I just mm. dumped to that. And now our practice is donating every year. We come to the end of the year, we're like, okay, we're going to donate to the political action side of things because that's, I hate to say it, but we are competing with some big money here. We can't take on the NRA, but just the, the thing is, and I, I realized this after going through it. We have trust. People do trust their pediatricians. And if a politician can even receive a hundred dollar donation from the American Academy of Pediatrics, they have that trust. It doesn't have to be a million dollars. That, that small amount of money with the trust that comes with it, that's where we can make a difference. And so we have to continue to capitalize on that as much as we can and leverage that trust in any way we can. And I, at this point, I feel like it's got to be political. And, and I stray away from political minefields my whole life. And I find it silly that I'm on the other side of it now. But when you see what a tragedy happened in your neighborhood, I couldn't just sit still and, and have nothing happen. And again, it was with that support. But so tell me a little bit more about this. Is it a PAC? Is it, does a Virginia AAP have a PAC? That, that is correct. Individuals yeah. can donate money to without being members of the AP. Yeah, or as a member, but I guess I thought some of my dues may be shunted to that. That is not happening. Mm -hmm. So you have to give it separately. And I was just naive to that as well. I think sometimes I like to live in my little naive bubble and not, not realize this, but so yeah, the Virginia has a PAC. It's the, if you just go to the Virginia American Academy of Pediatrics Political Action Committee, and I will say it's not really well-funded at this point, but even a small amount and that politician can say, look, I have the support of your pediatricians can go a long way when people are going to the polls and trying to, and this is 
is a huge deal in Virginia this year. We have a major turnover of, you can see complete flipping of the House and the, and the Senate. It's quite a big deal. And again, never stepped into this realm before. I felt I should stay out of it, but I'm in it now and it is much more important than I ever realized. And when you talk to the legislators and the senators, what is your experience? They're very knowledgeable on these issues. And do they just want you to write a check and go away? What is it like? Yes and yes. It's it's <laughs> that thing. They're human beings just like anybody else. I'm always impressed with people. I, I don't feel like I have any public speaking skills. I, 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 I'm happy to talk to you guys because you're colleagues. I, I feel like this podcast is going out to my people, my pediatricians, but as a politician, getting up and just doing public speaking intimidates me, your ability to do that. But uh, one of the legislators just, he literally just wanted the facts. What are, you, what are you supporting? What do you want me to do? Why should I do it? And that type of thing. So we had to give him the facts and he was very concrete. Others were just, just really wanted to know about us, get to know us, know what the, get into the depths of why we were supporting what we were supporting. It was a fascinating day. And to answer your question, you know, everything, we, we came across everything. It was nice to be there with people who are experienced talking to politicians. And I stood in the background and just listened and learned. We had residents come with us. So that was wonderful because one of the one of the bills that was passing was for nurse practitioner care and pharmacies delivering strep tests and others to children. And we got to speak about our level of training and have, the, have the, a resident talk to a politician about what they are just finishing up and how intensive their training is and to compare that to other health professionals just so they can hear it from the mouths of someone who's just finishing their residency was very powerful. And I think helped sway that vote because they did not uh, grant the, ex the extension of privileges um, to pharmacies here. So that was a big deal. Yeah. I've had a little bit of experience talking to legislators in Virginia and they are a fascinating bunch. They're mostly lawyers yeah. and they know very little about medicine or how medicine works, but it's, they'll, they'll sit down and have dinner with you and they'll ask all kinds of questions and be very intent in what, what you're telling them, because it's a whole world that they intersect like anybody else. We all at some point intersect with illness. They're really not knowledgeable about how things get funded, finance, how things work, why some neighborhoods are doing better than others. They just get a bunch of talking points from their national leadership and they think that's all there is to it. And there's so much more nuance. It's, it's really by the county. But you do know, they have any power to actually do anything? Do we? Whoever yes, we're talking. we do. We only lose our power when we think we don't have a voice. Yeah. I mean, th those politicians definitely have, have the power to change things. And I saw that. I was worried that this bill wouldn't pass because the school legislatures were against it. They wanted more time to report. They were worried about, I'm not exactly sure what they were worried about. We didn't really give them a chance to argue with the emotion behind our bill, but, but this bill could have died. A lot of bills about transgender care, they were really interested in, in, to your point, Dr. Bravo, they're really interested in what our side of the medicine world is. They wanted to hear it. I didn't feel like I was being, can't, I, I don't, I, I truly think they wanted to hear our opinion and I don't know if it swayed them or not. I know they, they've got all kinds of voices in their ears, but it is important for our voice to be one of them. And the way they vote can really change our, both our schools and our kids care dramatically and wow. our compensation. That's, that's another story for another day. I think it's wonderful you did this for the Commonwealth and especially for the memory of Brody and his mom and dad, this must've been somewhat I don't think you can ever get over the loss of a child, but this must have been at least something that helps a little bit in that journey. I hope so. Yeah. That's very sad. What do you think, or what do you see right now as the biggest challenges for the specialty of pediatrics? Ooh, that's a tough one. I could help with that. I think the problem is that Everybody around us, other than pediatricians, think we just take care of little children and we're not that important. And little children are not that important. You have to get the message out that actually little children become big children, big people, 
with chronic health care disease and pediatricians help to prevent that. So we have to get that me message and narrative going. I think I'm going to say the deterioration of trust in your medical home. I know that's a big topic, but I think we go back, we started this podcast talking about my grandfather going to people's houses and charging them $3 and leaving with a chicken instead of $3, but he had the respect of his community and he wasn't questioned. And some of the things he said back then were wrong. Like I look at it now as, oh my gosh, I can't believe my grandfather was telling them that this, that, or the other was the way to treat this disease. We now know better. So there's a middle ground there. You, it's okay to be skeptical. It's okay to question. But I, I certainly see a massive deterioration in the trust that we hold so near and dear. And I think as a community pediatrician, we still have it, but, and I'm still, I feel like I work every day to continue to try to cement that trust so that when really big life or death decisions come down, those parents know that I guided them the correct way with nutrition or breastfeeding or sports injuries or whatever it may be. So that when it comes to vaccinating your child against a deadly disease, that they'll continue to trust me. And I have seen that deterioration thanks to misinformation and it is difficult to combat. That's it. It's back to the, I told a story earlier before we were on about it when I was a teenager or not even a teenager, a 12 year old. And I was getting misinformation from another 12 year old about, about FLE like topics and the confusion it left in me. He was the beginning of misinformation, but it didn't go anywhere. If I had been able to get onto Google and research what I was being told when I was 12, I would have gone to some very dangerous websites and I probably would have been deeper into misinformation. And unfortunately those echo chambers exist. And that's why we need people like Dr. Paul Offit, who you guys have had on here, who is my hero to continue to do what they do and for us to listen and to reflect what he says. Paul is many persons' heroes. <laughs> what I like the most about Paul is his humility and his empathy. So he understands these decisions aren't easy for parents. The three of us, I say this because it's true, none of us are going to ever be able to be pregnant. So we won't have to decide whether we take an RSV shot while we have a baby in the womb and what harm that could do to the baby or if the baby's more premature or not. And I think often we are not humble enough and say, this is what we know today. The scale tips in your favor. It's not, nothing in life is a risk-free. You get in your car, you put your seatbelt on, you don't know you're going to come home. But you stay home, you could trip down the stairs you can't eliminate risk. That's just life. But we have to, he's very humble. He explains, here's the risk. Here's the advantage. That doesn't work for you. Maybe you do the hoarders on the baby, very low risk. It works really well, protects him the first season. And I think that's, we need a little bit more of that. And to your point, I came here as an immigrant in 1970. And I found America to be an incredibly kind country. I don't find that anymore. The kindness is gone. It's gone in Wegmans. It's gone in the exam room. It's gone when you're driving. We need to get back to being kind to each other. It's a necessary grease that allows the wheels to not blind so hard. And we don't want to lose our patience and see another measles epidemic in America. And you're right. That is a very serious reason for concern. Yeah. And uh, we just actually saw a patient with varicella disease. Really? Uh, oh yeah. Believe it or not. Wow. Was exposed to somebody that this little baby was 14 months. She delayed her vaccines. And of course she came in with varicella. Unfortunately, the physician that was on duty wasn't sure. What she, the, 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 so we had to, she sends me a text message. Uh, uh, I said, send over a picture. So she sends over a picture and we looked at it and confirmed it. So yeah. So she looks like the hero. As a, as a community member, although I, I understand what you're saying, Dr. Bravo, I'm going to respectfully disagree. I think the kindness is still there. It's just not trumpeted. And the lack of kindness is being trumpeted or put up on, on news sites and media, but the kindness is still there. I think the more you get involved with your community the more it gives back to you. And even with what you see sometimes nationally, 
you come back to your community and it's still a home. And, and that kindness is there. Uh, it's just hidden. It's not as upfront anymore. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but why do you think, Dr. John, that there's still hope that we'll be able to keep our doors open and take care of kids, which is ultimately what we want to do? Yeah. Because I think people who commit themselves to a pediatric training, I guess what I, what I would say, we do nothing better. <laughs> We're the best at doing nothing to children. And I think over time, parents come to realize that sometimes that's the best way to go. With RSV, I will say that many times. You get questions, should we use antibiotics? Should we use steroids? Should we use albuterol? And I'm answering no and no. We have millions of babies who came before yours where we tried it and it didn't work. I know it's instinctual to maybe try albuterol in this situation, but it, it, it makes things worse rather than better. And once they go through that, again, it's going back to trust. Because if you generate that trust through your time that you spend with families, which I know is becoming more and more limited, but then get outside your doors, get outside your building, whatever community you're in, whether it's in New York or Long Island or Montana or here in Virginia, you step outside, see what the community needs. Even that hour of, I don't care if it's being a coach or working with, if you're a dancer, just volunteering with that. It doesn't have to be medical. Just step outside in your community, build up that trust. That's how you're going to survive. I, I do think that's part of the secret to the success of at least my practice. And it wasn't really intentional. It was just because I felt like you needed to give back. So I, I think that's how we survive is that continued connection with community. It's very interesting to me. It's all over the papers that pseudoephedrine doesn't help with the cold. <laughs> or really, when did you discover that? <laughs> right? Oh, a little bit then, much, Dr. Rob. What I hate is when people give the, give, give the kids like NyQuil on these, some of these medicines have Benadryl, pseudoephedrine, Tylenol, that's Sermethrophan. I'm like, yeah, you're lucky the kid will come the next day. <laughs> oh, well, I used to give, remember back, I remember when I first started working, they used to give, what was it called for coughing? Codeine. Center, center again with codeine. Center again. Something like that. Yeah. It's called Benadryl. medicine. Mm -hmm. And they used to get upset when the new guys wouldn't prescribe it. The doctor <laughs> such and such used to do this all the time. Yeah. That, that's my proudest one-star review on Google. I had a parent come in demanding it and I refused to do it. And I got a one-star review because I wouldn't prescribe coding for his son's cough. And I just wanted that up at the top. I was like, that's fine. I'll take <laughs> that. <laughs> that's doing harm. <laughs> now, exactly. coding's not around at all, right? It's just. I'm sure it's around. No, it, the FDA put a warning label not to use in kids a while back. So I don't think you can find coding suspension anymore. I used it a lot for ear infections, but it's not always effective to manage pain. So they put a black label box and I don't think you can find it anymore. It's pretty interesting. interesting. I think things. Dr. John, what have I not asked you that I think is important to talk about? Oh boy. I don't know. It seems pretty complete. I'm trying to think. I have a good question for you. Yes, sir. If you were Dr. John of 25 years ago, 30 years ago, yeah, would you do it again? Oh, absolutely. Without a, without a doubt. Would you I recommend mean, it to your sons or your family members? I, I tried hard. <laughs> one, son, one son was a biology major. He got there, just did that left turn at organic chemistry and you know how it goes. And they're all working with computers and the internet now, but yes, I would absolutely recommend it. I do get upset with physicians who try to turn people away from the field of medicine. I understand that it's a, there are obstacles, but I'm a big follower of, of stoicism and philosophy and the obstacle is the way they put it there for a reason. And that's how you get through it. So. If you were to ask me, I would say I would do it again. Yeah, I would do it again. And my son is in medical school right now. He's the third year. And hopefully he'll go. I'm not pushing him, but hopefully he'll go into pediatrics. Yeah. And there's computers in pediatrics. Dr. the Bravo. Yeah, yeah. Plenty of computers. <laughs> plenty of computer stuff. But most physicians don't want to get involved in this extracurricular activities. I will say, because I grew my practice, once we got to the computer age, I was able to turn over the management to one of the younger physicians and two of them, and they are wonderful with it. I could take a, a big step back when that hit. So. And are you on ECW or OP? We are on ECW. 
not a fan. Uh, I'm word. not a fan. You don't have to answer that. I'm just going to say not a fan. You probably don't use it enough, but I'm, I'm sure I've seen it from the sidelines. It's not too terrible. Oh, yeah. You live with it for a week. You, you, you couldn't tell me. Can you live with it? You can live with it. Because it's in the That's part of the CIA. At the end of the day, they're all the same. They're all crud. As long as you can function, you can do your day to day activities, it's good enough. I don't know. It's better than my handwriting. Let's put oh, it that that's deaf. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I had to go admit a patient after your old. And this is before they had in, implemented Epic. And my office was all, it was all automated. And I sat down, I looked at the pen, and I go, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do? I don't remember how to write order sets. <laughs> I remember when we got the EHR, one of my part, business partners said, if we could eliminate all the phone calls from the pharmacies that came in asking, what did this guy write? <laughs> that would be well worth the cost of the EHR. Yeah. yeah. And in, in Virginia is worse because you can't write three prescriptions in one, one prescription. Yeah. Every drug has to be in a separate prescription. Yeah. Oh, some states allow you to put three drugs in one. So really? you just patient wants their date of birth, the date of that you're doing it, you sign it and you put the three things and you hand it to the patient. On one piece of paper? One piece of paper. Oh, I've never heard of such a thing. Chicago, Illinois does it like that. Maryland does it like that. Has to be a big prescription pad. I don't know. You just squeeze it in there. Nobody can read it any <laughs> All right. Uh, this has been a wonderful hour. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. John. I've always admired you, but now I have an even greater appreciation for the work you're doing. You've been a phenomenal pediatrician in the community, someone that we look at up to as a colleague. And I think this was a phenomenal win for the kids in the community with this legislation. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. We, we really enjoy everybody in my practice enjoys your podcast. And, uh, I think it is, it does recreate that physician's lounge that seems to no longer exist. So, yeah. so right. share our podcast, have your friends share it, spread the word. I think we're becoming uh, a little popular. I don't know, popular, but I think we are changing the narrative. We're changing the narrative. That's a for sure. We want people to realize that there's genius pediatricians sure. in all colors, flavors, and practices. Some are in salt practices. Some are in academia, some of them are running their groups, and it's a wonderful group of people. Yeah. And those are the stories we want to share. All right. Are you going to be at NC? John? I will be. It's oh, in NC this year, so you got to go. <laughs> and we'll be there also. Well, on the show notes, you will find links to Dr. Leah Kajina's podcast, The Pediatric Meltdown. There you will find links to more information about death by suicide in children. I highly recommend that you listen to her 10 or so episodes if this is an issue that is of interest to you. You may also find in her library gun prevention strategies to prevent death by suicide, the number one cause of adolescent and preteen cause of death in the U.S. Please also make it a point to visit our sponsor, PCC, at booth 1626, booth 1626, at the AAPNCE DC 2023. It is because of a generous grant from sponsors like PCC that we are able to bring this podcast to you every week. Additionally, don't forget to visit booth 1527, booth 1527, Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami. As you all know, I'm a big fan of their CME. This year, 2024, will be the 59th postgraduate CME in Coral Gables, Miami, in March of 2024. This event is put on by our guest and a good friend of the podcast, Dr. Grant Ranny who is also on the NCE planning committee 
and he does a phenomenal job of bringing CME that is important to the practicing physician. I would love to see you in Miami and talk some more. So again, don't forget to visit booth number 1527, Nicholas Children's Hospital in Miami, and learn about their CME, March 2024 in Coral Gables, Miami.